Okay, very good. So um, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, it's a great pleasure to have uh, David Mazzucca today and Jorge Ramirez. Uh, both of them have extensive experience in uh, post-catastrophe reconstruction uh, in the US and they bring a wealth of, of, of experience in the US and abroad. Uh, they're going to give us um, interesting, an interesting structure uh, uh, to think of the, of the entire process. Um, we tend to spend maybe 20-25 minutes on, on, on their talk and we leave perhaps a bit uh, more than half of the time allocated uh, today for, for Q&A. So uh, David, Jorge, maybe you guys can say a little bit more about your, your profile so people understand what's, uh, what's interesting to, to follow today. Certainly. Uh, let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is David Mazuka, and I'm joined by Jorge Ramirez today for us to be discussing disaster management, understanding post-disaster rebuilding operations. We're going to go through our biographies in just a second, but we want to highlight what today's agenda will be. We're going to do an introduction to what disaster recovery programs are, discuss processes, and then go into lessons learned from our own experiences, as well as some recommendations we have. So as for our biographies, my name is David Mazuka, as I just mentioned. I am a Hitachi International Affairs Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. I am in residence right now at the Disaster Prevention Research Institute at Kyoto University. So I am in Kyoto, Japan right now, which is just after uh, 10 p.m. local time. Prior, I served as, former, as the Assistant Director for Housing Recovery with New Jersey's Sandy Recovery Division. I was in that role from 2015 to 2019, uh, where I was responsible for New Jersey's housing restoration grant programs, uh, totaling 1.4 billion US dollars in federal funds. Uh, these would be the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Dollars. With that, let me turn over to my colleague, Jorge, to discuss his background. Good morning. <clears throat> well, good morning. I'm coming to you from Puerto Rico. I know David's on the other side of the world, and it's uh, 9 o'clock for him. So good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Jorge Ramirez. I am the president of Resilient Strategies Group. That is a company that does consulting in disaster recovery. Uh, I started out as the former director for the uh, disaster recovery program at the Texas General Land Office. <clears throat> Pardon me, where I managed a $3.5 billion disaster that did uh, housing and infrastructure. Since then, I've uh, consulted uh, for disaster recovery in New York City, New Jersey, uh, Florida, and I am now in uh, Puerto Rico. David? All right, let's do the intro. So, to start with, whether following a cyclone or a war, a project is a project. At the end of the day, the objective for any disaster recovery operation is to move from debris and destruction to a functional and safe community. Now, when it comes to a disaster recovery program, you only can pick two of the following, either rebuild fast, rebuild for the least cost, or rebuild at high quality. From our experiences, both Jorge and mine, we realize that many disaster recovery programs often try to do all three and are not successful. And for that matter, are not even successful in knocking out two of the three. It's important when you're building out a program to recognize that you can only pick two of these three things from the start. If you do that, you will more likely have a successful recovery program. Now, recovery itself must be holistic. It is extremely important to bring the local economy back. Now, long-term economic recovery is not possible without the restoration of infrastructure and housing stock in the community. One must recognize that stakeholders are not just government, but are residents, industry, <clears throat> and businesses, small and large businesses. Operations, disaster recovery operations, should be scalable and adaptable to meet diverse community needs. We will walk through today what we mean by scalable and adaptable, but in the end, the concept is you need to be able to adjust over time to whatever the needs are for your community. 
Now, if rebuilding is delayed, many households and businesses will likely relocate to other areas, other communities for that matter, possibly even other countries. That can stunt economic health and can negatively impact the tax base, something you want to avoid. Now let's discuss the process. Okay, so the, the first and most important part, and it seems kind of obvious, is that you need a plan. <clears throat> now, this is a huge project. It's more of a, of a program. The first, what you want to do is you want to get started quickly, but if you do that without a plan, uh, that's, that's a formula for failure. You'll need to figure out your objectives, and organizations succeed when they know why they're doing what they're doing, what they're doing, and especially how they're going to do it. You need to build the road plan for the people that are going to help you recover. Part of the uh, deliverables of the plan are uh, budget allocation, which I will talk about in uh, slide number eight, uh, distribution uh, methods. How are you going to distribute the, the money? Just this morning, I was talking to my wife and she said, why can't you just get started quickly? And this is one of the reasons. Who, who gets started first? Which projects are more important? Uh, should we do infrastructure? Should we do schooling? And if you choose infrastructure, the infrastructure of which city and what part of the infrastructure? So you really need to think about how you're going to distribute these funds. Who gets the funding? Because more than likely, and we'll talk about this in a second, there will not be enough funding. And then you need to do the an unmet need assessment. You're going to have people that are not going to be helped by this program due to the lack of funds or for whatever reason. You want to keep a list of that so you know what exactly you need to cover in case more money comes along. And then you need to discover, then you need to determine the project types. Uh, obviously, there will be housing. What kind of housing? Is it going to be modular? Is it going to be single family, multifamily? And then you're going to have economic development. <clears throat> As David said, some people may not want to come back. Some people may not be able to come back or they have opportunities somewhere else. Economic development is a great way of bringing the economy back into a municipality and helping the people that want to help you recover by giving them some grants and motivation to come back because it will be hard for them to come back. And then of course, infrastructure, sewer, water, uh, power, uh, which projects are the most important ones. You'll also have to determine whether you're gonna to have to have, you're gonna have a centralized approach or a decentralized approach. Is this gonna be managed by one agency? And is that one agency gonna have a czar or is it gonna be managed by a committee which has its own problems? And if you manage the funds in a central location, are, there, are they gonna be distributed to, uh, managed by completely by that uh, central location or are they gonna be distributed to grantees that are gonna be responsible for managing the project themselves. So you need to develop this plan and really think it through. It's not gonna be perfect, but it's gonna be your guide to recover faster. David. Thank you, Corey. Now, the community itself, whether we're talking about a community in the United States, whether in the state of New Jersey or state of Texas, whether we're talking about a community in Belgium or France, Australia, Japan, or Ukraine, community is a stakeholder. And it's vital to include public comments when building out any kind of disaster recovery program. Now, the way you do that is by having regularly scheduled in-person public outreaches before a program is even developed. You want to receive that input so that you understand what the community needs are. Now, once you build out a program of some kind, you want to be very honest forthright with the community in what the program components are, what the program is, and for that matter, what the program isn't. You want to be able to manage community expectations. And the only way you can do that is through engagement. You also want to be able to incorporate community organizations and long-term recovery groups that may exist as part of the engagement process. Though realize there will be competing and contradictory community interests. Know that from the start in order to best manage those differing views. Last but not least, you do want to establish a realistic time frame for recovery. This falls in line with the concept of meeting community expectations. 
an unrealistic time frame will set expectations that cannot be met. Too often, disaster recovery programs make that error, promising the world and delivering far from that. It's best to understand what it is that you're delivering and be honest about how long it will take. Ore? Okay, so what is the need? <clears throat> Obviously, the need is huge, but what is most needed is what you're going to have to determine. Uh, is it housing? Uh, again, uh, public housing may be the best, or you may actually, at this point in time, reconsider your housing. Whatever it was at the time, at this point, it's, uh, maybe it's time to reinvent. Uh, economic development. Uh, which industry are you going to need to bring? Uh, especially the ones that are going to be necessary at the start of this recovery. And uh, as I mentioned before, infrastructure. Uh, what kind of infrastructure is more important? Uh, and, it, and it's all important. Which one is needed first in the timeline of your recovery, which is going to be essential. When you're preparing this recovery on the plan that I mentioned, what is going to bring the people back? You cannot build the homes first without rebuilding the infrastructure. So your timeline is very important, especially with respect to infrastructure. It usually has to come first. Um, with respect to the budget, it's always gonna be limited. You're not gonna have enough. But the real question is, can that budget expand? Because, and it's likely going to expand because if it can expand, then you have those unmet needs that you had written down before. If you have a group of people that you weren't able to help, if you determine the unmet need in your plan, once you have more monies, then you're gonna be ready to accept those people based on the categories and the priorities that you set before in your plan. Uh, last, uh, does your budget align with the goals? You will, and, and I'm sorry to keep harping on this, but you will not have enough money. I've never worked in a program where we've given a dime back. It is all very important. So what are your goals and can the budget meet those goals? Uh, you will of course wanna rebuild as much as possible. You're not gonna rebuild the whole thing, but you have to be careful with your, with your plan on what you're planning to rebuild. And let me explain what I, uh, what I mean. <clears throat> in most of the disaster recovery programs that are worked, there is a relocation aspect. And in the relocation aspect, because we're moving people away from a floodplain, you're trying to move people out of that floodplain. And what ends up inevitably happening is you rescued them, but then you have a community where you've left little bits of houses that never moved back. So is that something that you wanna do? What do you wanna rebuild? Do we wanna tackle it all? Do we wanna tackle groups of places or, or just a small smidgen across all the projects that you have? David? Great. So now we're going to dive into lessons learned and recommendations. So first up on the lessons learned slide, you want to make your policies and procedures flexible and straightforward. Realize that the initial version will be inadequate, and that is okay. These are living documents that should evolve over time. That said, as they evolve, you want to ensure that you are communicating such changes to all members of the community. Now, you do wanna keep the process as simple as possible. That is important when it comes to communicating what the program is and is not. Recognize that mistakes will be made. Accept errors, learn, adjust, and move forward. Uh, in every program this happens, uh, there is a mistake that is made. Remember, you made a plan. The plan is just a guide. It, there's gonna be something wrong with it. When you make a mistake, it's no time to finger point. That only is gonna slow you down. Who made the mistake is the last thing you do. You probably wanna find out in case some vendor or someone needs to be removed from the project. But first you try to fix, try to look at this as an opportunity. What is the root cause of the mistake? and do an analysis and figure out how to, fi how to fix it holistically and systematically so that it doesn't happen again. You also want to ensure that you have that continuous engagement with stakeholders. As mentioned a moment ago, talking about the policies and procedures and keeping this process as simple as possible, it is important that stakeholders are involved at all steps in the process so they are aware of such changes, what a program is and what a program is not. 
expect progress to start slowly, allow for organic growth. Now, uh, for most of the folks that I work with in disaster recovery, this is probably the most controversial uh, bullet that I will have. Uh, I've, I've added this in solicitations that I've applied for because there's a saying in disaster recovery here in the US, we never have time to get it right, but we always have time to fix it. I'm gonna say that one more time. We never have time to get it right, but we always have time to fix it. To me, that's just silly. But we spend a lot of time going really, really fast, solving all the problems that we caused because we didn't take the time to slow down. Every program that I've ever worked with starts, fails, and then restarts. Uh, usually that's because of expectations were too high at, at the start and the company that was, the agency, I'm sorry, that was managing, they, they wanted something. Uh, and they want to show the media quick wins. Oh, look how many houses we fixed this month. When you start the program, this is the time to slow down. It is the time to learn your lessons. You will be working a bit with vendors that are getting to know you. You're getting to know the process. So let it allow, allow it to grow organically. What I mean by that is learn from the mistakes that you have made and improve the program. Eventually, you will reach a steady state. David, no, there's more about continuous, uh, conduct continuous engagement. That's yours. Yes, and I, I said that a moment ago, but continuous engagement is really important for all stakeholders. Okay, all right, um, my, my apologies. Let me continue mine. Uh, expect progress to start slowly. Um, allow construction vendor uh, vendors to make a profit. Uh, this is also, vendors are also part of the economy. Uh, it's okay for vendors to make a profit. Too many times I see agencies that are angry uh, that vendors are making money or too much money, uh, whatever that may mean. And I'm sure there are instances where vendors do make too much money. Uh, but for the most part, the vendors are there to make some sort of profit and it's okay. You just need to tie their success to your success. Uh, they are part of the economy as well. If you use vendors from U Ukraine and you're trying to develop your economy, you're developing them as well. So vendors are part of this holistic approach that you are uh, trying to do for the uh, community. Diminishing utility of returns. Reframe the problem, don't just add people. <clears throat> That's another thing that I've seen way too many times. You have a problem, add more people. I'm going to give you an example of uh, in one of my last projects, I was managing a warehouse and this gentleman came up to me that he wanted me to improve his order form because people were not coming in at the right times. Uh, they were coming in with the wrong vehicles and making going where, where if you brought the right vehicle, there would be one delivery instead of three times going in there. So his bandwidth was getting really tied up. He wanted to improve the form and they were going to open up a third shift. This is a reframing of the problem. I'm sure you heard that People don't want drill bits, they want holes. When you reframe the problem in the warehouse, for example, what we did is we created a system or we tried to develop a system where we delivered the materials to the vendors. That way we were packaging everything faster, the warehouse became more efficient and we weren't slowing them down by making them come to the warehouse and going. They get the packages, they deliver it, we sped up the process and financially it became more stable. So again, don't just add people to the problem, try to reframe the problem and see if you can have a solution that, that, that doesn't just add more, more folks. Okay, there will be uh, waste, fraud and abuse. Uh, it will happen too often uh, to completely stop it, which is something that you cannot do. Compliance teams will create very elaborate requirements. What this does is it slows down your progress. So when you're thinking about your compliance, uh, you have to consider the cost that these requirements are gonna have to the extent to which they're gonna slow down your progress. Also, a better way to control uh, the fraud, waste, and abuse is to make corruption uh, expensive and costly so people don't do it. QA prevented through laws, QC, control it by targeting it without inhibiting your progress too much. I'm not saying to allow it, please don't understand that, but appropriately apply your compliance team 
and quite frankly, modify it as it grows because you're going to begin to see things. And too many times I've seen that the compliance plan is the same from when you started to when it ended without utilizing it, you, without the compliance team working with the operations team and trying to figure out, well, where can we target it better? Have we made it too prohibitive here? Not enough over here. Bureaucracies will get in your way. Um, when I think of bureaucracy, I think of the permitting process. For example, if you are trying to build a single family home, it's okay, you do need to have permits and you need to have inspections. But you just created a program where you hired the vendors, you created a process, you have monitor. Why not exempt them from the permitting process or create a more expedited process? So when you're thinking about uh, your plan, incorporate the bureaucracy in there. And by incorporating it, I mean, realize where it is and figure out if there's things that you can do to modify it. You are incorporating compliance and monitoring in your plan. Why should you also then double up with the existing building codes or anything else that, that is out there that you're doing? Um, it is unlikely that there will be enough local vendors and construction label. I will speak to that in my next slide. People will, may not wanna come back to their prior communities of res residence. You, you want to create outreach to bring them back, incentives to bring them back. And as I said before, the best incentives are economic de development, where you get people to come back because there are opportunities, quite frankly. Next slide. Okay, every recovery program of the size will have a capacity, capacity issue. Imagine, um, here where I'm at, we're building thousands of houses. In Texas, we build, uh, 12,000 houses, 3,600 infrastructure projects. In Puerto Rico, we're building thousands of homes, solar panels, all sorts of stuff. A program this size will make it difficult for you to, fi to find vendors, let alone qualified vendors. There are not gonna be enough of them. And again, remember, don't try to squeeze a penny because you're gonna get the wrong vendor instead of getting the right one. You're gonna get the lowest bidder instead of getting the more qualified one, which at the end may cost you less because you have less administration. Now, add to that a pandemic, hyperinflation and a war. And then add on top of that, the fact that your vendors for this program should be coming from the local community. That's the challenge that you're going to have. That's the first thing that <clears throat> I would start working in the procurement, in figuring out that problem. How will you get people back? Okay, so how do you uh, mitigate this? Smart procurement or procurement pools. Uh, if you're going to hire an engineer to build the bridge by the lake, don't hire the engineer that's gonna build the bridge by the lake. Procure engineers that can design bridges. Better yet, procure engineers. That way you do one procurement instead of doing multiple procurements. And then you can utilize them across the board. <clears throat> you don't know what you're gonna need until you need it. Economic development, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are going to be businesses that are going to get started because of this disaster. There are going to be businesses that were hurt by this disaster and probably will never recover unless they receive help from us. That's economic development. And that's the key to getting those qualified vendors back into your community. Strategic partnering for training and mentoring. You will need outside help. You will need people that have done this before, that have the resources. My recommendation here is bring them in. They're going to be extremely essential for your program. But when you bring them in, require that the capacity be from the local community. In other words, they bring 25% uh, of their experts. The other 75% are people that are hired from your community. <clears throat> be flexible on this, though. You need to be careful because sometimes maybe the 75% are not there. So, but bring that in there and make it a requirement that they do training because once they leave in however long that is, those people are going to remain and they're gonna be part of your economy. They and last but not least, discussing recommendations from the operations standpoint. You wanna ensure that your payment system it works in a timely fashion. One of the things you want to avoid at all costs is delaying payment to a vendor that has completed a job. That does not create a healthy relationship, quite the opposite. You want to make sure that you do not overcomplicate 
any kind of procurement processes or methodologies that you've established. Keep things as simple as possible. As Jorge said a few moments ago, you want to ensure that compliance does not hinder operations, but rather assist operations. Your system of record, databases for instance, should be easy to develop and modify. Too often we've witnessed how teams spend months, if not years, developing and then continuing to make systems changes. That is a waste of energy and time. Your system of record should be easy to develop and modify. Better yet, if it's off the shelf, that would be great. Your policies and procedures should be flexible and easy to revise. As we mentioned, they should evolve over time. They are living documents. And your standard operating procedures, simple and approachable. You want these documents for all stakeholders, government, business, industry, and residents to be able to read, understand, and work within the procedures. So with that, we appreciate everyone's time and are happy to take some questions. Great, many thanks uh, for this. This was uh, really, really well structured. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but before I go to my questions, I'm just going to take the first question. Victoria is asking, uh, what should Ukraine focus on during the recovery period? Should uh, we focus on the most affected regions and postpone the reconstruction of other regions? So in a sense, uh, she's asking, what, what should be the balance between recovery of what was lost uh, and sustaining what's still available. Um, just to give you a little bit of, of uh, context to this, during the war, there was a large internal displacement. Many people left, many businesses left from the East and they went West. And there are some perverse effects of this in terms of economics. For example, rents went up a lot in the, in the West, uh, uh, reflecting you know, this in, in tremendous inflow of, of, of people and businesses. The longer it takes, the more the business wants to basically establish itself in the West. So this is, I think, you know, if you want the context, how, how, do, we, how do we look at things um, you know, um, in, from this perspective? I mean, I'll take a stab at this first. From the perspective of what you just described, I think it's important to create an economic incentivization structure to try to encourage business to go and work in the operating parts of the country that they may have left, that being going from the east to the west. Uh, to what uh, her question was about it would do, what areas do you focus on rebuilding, okay. I think you have to walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah. You know, coming from my experience in New Jersey, we didn't necessarily just focus on one area of the state that was devastated. We focused on the entire uh, devastation, which was north to south from Cape May County all the way up to Bergen County in New Jersey. So I think it's important to be able to do all at once. That said, the bigger question, I think, is what kind of program is designed? Is it centralized or decentralized, as Jorge was alluding to in one of the slides? I think if you have a much more decentralized approach, it is easier to say, let's work at the local level and each local level will have their own individual programs, however that may be. But I'm sure Hori has some comments as well. So let me turn it over to him. Thanks, David. Well, this is part of that plan that I was talking about. And it's, uh, it's gonna be one of the hardest things that you probably will have to do because it's, uh, it's based on reality and you need to make some hard choices. And it's gonna be based on your budget. First, you need to figure out how much how much we're talking about here, because there are going to be some communities that are going to be harder to recover than others. So you may have to you may have to pick the ones that are more realistic to recover. I have seen instances where a program gets X amount of dollars and then they try to please everybody. That may not be the best choice. You're going to end up with communities that recovered 10% and then they get hit with hard choices. You want you want to be realistic and pragmatic. And, and I think that's one of the first things that you do. You create that team that's going to procure based on the budget and make those hard determinations. Yeah, many thanks for this. Um, I think in this respect, you know, what, what I, it's uh, transferring is, you know, you mentioned very clearly we need housing because otherwise people don't come back, but then they come back to a nice house and no job. That looks very unlikely. 
So it looks like, you know, at the time that we talk about reconstruction, there's also in, in, in a sense a, a, a business development strategy that has to go in, in place. So when it's a small, or let's say it's a geographically limited community, this is perhaps something that can be fairly easily done. What about a large uh, shock where you have, you know, something like a conflict, like, uh, some type of something like a large earthquake that damages so many parts of your economy at the same time? How is this usually juggled? The damages in an entire, are you talking a large community, like a large metropolitan area? Yeah, I'm thinking more of regions, right? Because the one thing that's clear, you know, you, we need to get businesses back, that's clear. But then some businesses would need inputs from, let's say, the East. The East is under fire. There's no way the, these are going to. So they have to, like, rethink their entire, uh, uh, their entire uh, operation. But I'm thinking even broader in terms of industries, because some industries um, have been shut down. They cannot provide intermediate inputs to some other uh, industries. And, and you know, I'm I'm thinking of a Fukushima type of thing where you have a let's say a producer of electricity that was delivering to the entire country. The fact that that disappeared in a sense affects everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, just that in our case, this this goes into energy, goes into uh, agriculture, goes into extractive uh, industry, and so on and so forth. Okay, <clears throat> so that that makes me think of the current project that I'm that I'm in because one of the biggest problems that they have here is power. Uh, it's very unreliable. There are brownouts. This is an opportunity to realize that, you know, one thing took you out. So it's a matter of resiliency. When you come back, are you going to come back the way you were before? And it probably you discovered the fact that, you know what, this happened and it affected everybody. We may want to decentralize power. One of the things that is happening here is they have a program for solar panels and cisterns because the power is unreliable and fixing that power plant exceeds whatever budget they have. So it's not possible. Again, there are things that you can do and there's things that you can't and it's all based on the budget. So I would look at the budget and figure out how you can rebuild and rebuild resiliency, resiliently. Here, solar panels are going and batteries are going in all the homes. So when a disaster strikes, you don't have to depend on that uh, power station. So I, I hope that answers your question. Yep, yep. Let, let me jump in a little bit because you mentioned the Japanese experience with Fukushima. The, the key there when the rebuilding is going on right now, I know this from some of the research I've been doing, it's building differently. It's knowing that certain industries are not returning. For that matter, certain communities cannot return to where they were, um, whether that means totally relocating to a different part of the prefecture or we're going further inland or in higher ground. And I think taking that mindset and thinking about the situation in Ukraine, it's about what is rebuilt? What can be achieved in the short term versus long term? Is there an economic incentivization structure that's mapped out over a multi-year period, realizing that people may not be returning initially? And if that's the case, maybe it is building smaller communities. Because rebuilding something like it was and having empty housing, as you alluded to a moment ago, does no one any good. You want communities to be sustainable. Sustainable doesn't mean like it was. It may mean smaller. Yeah, understood. And, and by the way, what David is talking about is going to require a management plan, like an outreach marketing plan. <clears throat> because it makes all the sense in the world. But there's somebody out there, there's a community out there that is going to be very unhappy. Reality in programs is wonderful, but it's not accepted uh, as well as, hey, I'm going to help you here. I'm going to start a credit. That is one of the things that I've not been able to see because we're, we, we're, we're dealt, we deal with our emotions differently. And when creating these programs, if you're pragmatic, they're going to work, but media or something is going to get in the way. So you have to be careful with your messaging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the last thing I should add is talking about the Ukrainian situation. So many people are displaced in country and for that matter, outside of Ukraine. The community engagement process, it would be different than something that Jorge and I would be dealing with in the United States. And it's best to be thinking now about what that engagement process looks like virtually, because so many people want to be part of the conversation, but will not be able to literally be at an in-person outreach in their home community. 
Um, and you don't want to lose those comments that the, the interest, particularly of those who will be returning, just because someone can't attend in person. Um, and that's something that's, again, different from our experiences, but I think that's something that needs to be considered. Yeah, yeah. Anton is asking the following question. Uh, he's saying, there is an opinion that instead of temporary housing, the state could spend money on rent for those who lost it because the developers have empty space. What do you think about that? Uh, coming from the New Jersey experience, uh, I think that's a great idea. Uh, I'm a big believer in getting people into existing housing stock, rental housing that may be available, um, rather than if we're talking about temporary housing, I assume the question is referring to more uh, trailers or uh, that to along those lines. Um, the more you can get people into existing stock within existing infrastructure, the better. Okay, yeah, I think that the question is, instead of spending money on reconstructing, maybe giving people uh, 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 money for rent, but of course the implicit thing is, you know, before a person would be a homeowner, now it's a renter. So there's this, this perhaps angle also in that question. Okay, that's a, that's yeah. a different, yeah, that's a different, yeah. Yeah, uh, Alexander asks, what kind of incentives government can consider to attract local and international business in, in devastated regions? Uh, sometimes uh, that can be in the shape of uh, forgivable loans. Uh, in other words, you give someone an incentive to come and you give them an amount of money and they, and they have to provide something for the, for the community. Uh, let's say that you, you, wanna, you have someone to come and do outreach and you're willing to give them a grant and it's a loan. Uh, they, if they work for a certain amount of period and create certain jobs, then it will eventually be forgivable. That's how you're gonna bring people in. That's, that's one side. I don't know if uh, David, uh, you have another suggestion. No, I think you, you nailed the one spot on, Hori. Very good. Um, another question from Victoria, how will a post-war reconstruction operation differ from a post-disaster? recovery operation so in a sense what makes war things what 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 does it produce differently so much of the work that we have done is of course in response to a disaster and thus making a um, structure infrastructure housing stock more resilient whether it's in response to flooding a hurricane an earthquake tornado whatever it may be in a war you're not necessarily building something to be inherently resilient to that the net the, the disaster that just occurred you may be building a structure to be more resilient for climate, environmental, for whatever, a number of other reasons. Um, so I think it's just a different prism. At the end of the day, though, as we said, a project is a project. It's about getting shovels in the ground, businesses to return, families to return to communities. Um, so what it looks like at the end is not incredibly different, but the, the how you're designing your program and what, what you're trying to achieve it is different. And I don't know if Jorge has a different opinion on that. No, no, no. It's, it, I, I agree with you. The only thing is, I guess, when people go back to a place that, that where there was a disaster, if they can go back to a more resilient home, psychologically, it helps for them to go back. Here, uh, you know, will they go back into an area where this may happen again? Uh, this is not going to prevent it from happening again. I mean, there could be some projects that you could do an in infrastructure that could help out a little bit but I, it's highly doubtful. So the psychological as, uh, aspect and the outreach that you have to bring people back. Yeah, actually I was thinking of uh, one thing that uh, you put down there and you said rebuild how much, all or some. And um, I'm, I'm thinking that in this particular case, uh, areas that, that are very close to the conflict line, maybe people will feel very, very, very uh, unlikely to, to return. So then in, in a sense, rethinking this by offering perhaps communities or perhaps extending existing communities might be possibly uh, an alternative. So rather than losing them because they choose another country, offer them something inside of the country where they would feel comfortable, where obviously the, the cost is that these prior communities are no longer there. Um, so in, in, your, in your experience, in your observation, you know, when something like this hits out of the existing population, how much comes back? It, it varies on circumstance. Often with disasters, uh, uh, climactic disasters, it is all about what the, what the situation was before the storm occurred or earthquake occurred. Um, the disaster simply 
exponentially exasperate the existing circumstances. Um, so, I, I mean, that's not exactly answering your question, but my point being is if the economy was on the decline in a 10 year period before disaster struck, the, that economy is going to have all the more trouble coming back. If, on the other hand, it was on the incline, the recovery is going to be all the more fast. I've seen, uh, I'm, I'm always amazed at how much of the economy comes back, actually. Uh, I, I don't have a measure other than the fact that in the areas that I've, that I've worked in, uh, people do want to come home. They do. They love it. Uh, there are certain coastal towns that we continue to rebuild year after year after year. I think of uh, Louisiana. Louisiana got hit with, what, five hurricanes last year, David? I don't know if you, mm. and, and they're still rebuilding and they will continue to rebuild. I'm currently on an island uh, where all the hurricanes pass by as they make their way to Louisiana. Uh, people are rebuilding. People are still here. Uh, there may be some people that have left permanently, but uh, others take their place. Uh, people people want to go home. Understood, many, many things. Any further questions, any comments uh, from the audience? If not a uh, one last uh, uh, thing, so you you mentioned this allocation. Do we do we allocate to, to geographies that have been hard hit and try to to solve housing infrastructure, schools, etc., or do we have a functional uh, allocation and keep, keep, you know think about infrastructure, uh, uh, connect everything uh, properly, and so on and so forth, regardless of how much it hit in one region as opposed to another region. So. How, how do we look at this? Is this a trade-off in a sense? Do we want to recover particular region as much as possible or do we want to uh, recover particular aspects of the economy infrastructure? Does it depend on the, on the shock? It, I, again, this is, it, repen, it, it depends on the reality. This is part of the task that your team is gonna have. I would also defer that it is cultural. <laughs> if you go to different, I, I've worked in, and this is within the United States, in five separate states, and they're all very, very different. They all want something differently. They react differently to the recovery. The team that you have, an internal team that's going to sit down and develop this program and allocate the budgeting across infrastructure, housing, and what, for starters, I believe that in order for something, let's, let's think of one project, in order for a project to recover, let's say there's either 10,000 projects or five, but let's just consider the individual project. In that individual project, you're going to have to do enough infrastructure, housing, and economic devel development to fix it. So how many of those individual projects you can have? If you try to fix all 10,000, none of them are gonna recover. So you're going to have to determine the mix of infrastructure, economic development per project. Now, which projects are excluded is going to be a very hard choice made by the people of Ukraine, not, not by a vendor. That's definitely not something that I would recommend. A vendor can guide, but you, you know better than anybody that's gonna come in from the outside to tell you which projects you should be doing. That's, that's, that's uh, theological. And that's where coming to a more decentralized approach would likely have the most value in Ukraine by doling out money to the regions and then letting them decide how they want to spend those dollars versus making those decisions in Kyiv. Um, for that matter, that is the United States model. The federal government doles out the money, but the states develop the program. And that, I think, is an important part to why the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Funding is ultimately a success, because you are able to take in the regional cultural nuances uh, that Jorge had alluded to just now. Um, versus a top-down approach. Anton is asking a little bit about timing. So he's saying architects and urban designers are already developing projects in territories that are still under fire. Uh, isn't it too early to make such projects? I mean, David, I don't want to say, but yes, it seems like uh, it would. Um, are these... There are Go on. I was just going to say, Hori, there are projects and there are projects. What I mean is, and I assume the, the question is in reference to private enterprise right now rebuilding, not to be confused by government supported rebuilding efforts. Um, so uh, the private sector, everyone 
does what they see fit. From a government perspective, it's about thinking through what the programs would be and how fund money would be spent. But again, I, I don't know the, the specific situation that he's re Anton's referring to. I'm assuming these are private, right? Is that what he's referring? Probably, I don't know. There's there's no context to it, but I think it is uh, it is private because generally, there you know most of the public finances are are dedicated to supporting war efforts. So I don't I don't think the government is building high rise, you know, when there's not enough money for bonds in a sense. Very good. Uh, any further questions? Any further comments? That, you know what, I will, I, I will add one thing that I was thinking about this morning. <clears throat> um, remember I said that programs usually start, they fail and then they restart. Um, the communities will always wanna do it. Uh, passion, enthusiasm, whatever the rationale is, they feel that they, that they can get it done. These are very complex uh, projects. And, and, and also, at the, here in the US, you, both Dave and I have been in this for about a decade, and we are so-called subject matter experts that know how to navigate all the rules and regulations that have been created for programs such as this. Um, over there, you're starting from scratch. Uh, it's something that currently does not exist. There is no playbook. You're almost like parents, right? You just, you need to get it started. But there are folks out there that can guide you and, and help you, uh, especially in, in sort of like project management. So that is something that happens in the US and that's why it starts and refails. You have to get the right uh, guidance from, from this small group of community. And I would also add that <clears throat> there, are, there have been instances where that guidance that you're receiving from this vendor was not good guidance you need because they can create a program that starts tucking the costs and it's it's very intense in compliance and it's just time and materials and it's just costing more and more so you need you also need something would be like an owner's rep someone that's not connected to making more money that can give you guidance uh, as to how to structure your program so i guess what i'm trying to say is you need some expertise to come to the country and help you uh, create this program. Understood. Uh, we have one question from Natalia, um, uh, which is related to damage buildings and infrastructure. Who pays for debris management? So I think the broader question is what are what are good ways to, to handle these large amounts of, of debris following the following a large shock that destroys houses and bridges and stuff? I can take this if you want, David, or me. Yeah, go ahead, Hori. Yeah, you, you have direct experience in Texas with this. So yeah, that's the first thing that you do, right? You get rid of the debris. It is here. That is one part where it's very, very compliance oriented. You have to, it's, you hire a bunch of companies. They're all experts in debris. And every little thing that they, you charge sort of like by the pound, everything that they remove has to be weighed, measured, and certified. Because otherwise, that's very easy to fake. Uh, when, you, when you tell them, I want a house over here, you're going to see the end product. But moving the debris, oh, it was tons. We had to remove all this stuff. There was rebar. Uh, there was so much work that needed to be done. So that is an area that does require intense compliance. Very good. Um... Roman is, a, is a saying, hi, thanks a lot. How, how to combine comprehensive, comprehensive approaches for master planning and the need for housing before the winter. So there's immediate housing needs and a master plan. And, and that's where it comes back down to the question, uh, our conversation a few moments ago about rental housing. Um, winter is coming. Um, yeah, you want to capitalize and utilize as much of the existing housing stock that is out there, but at the end of the day, that likely will still not be enough. Um, so it's about looking at temporary housing solutions, winter, winter excuse me, weatherized housing okay. solutions um, that can withstand uh, the cold temperatures that uh, do occur uh, throughout Ukraine. Um, and I know there are a variety of projects out there now, uh, people exploring how to get temporary housing into the country. 
um, because uh, that's the only solution um, given the climate of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Irina is asking a financing question. She, she's asking how are grants different from forgivable loans? Or if there is such a difference? Uh, a grant, you're, you're eligible for a grant. Uh, let's say I'm a homeowner. Uh, usually uh, in what, what we do in the US, this is for low to moderate income people. And they have to come and they have to provide, they have to show that they were damaged and you do intake and eligibility and then they're approved and they get a house. Um, <clears throat> they just get... Uh, a new home or they get their home repaired. Forgivable loans, you need to meet certain objectives. You need to be in business. You need to have uh, five staff for every 10,000 you borrow. I'm throwing fake numbers out there, but it's, it's a loan that if you don't do what you promised that you would do, you will have to pay back. So basically extra constraints to get in, extra constraints to get out. Uh, Natalia is asking, um, uh, who pays for debris management? Homeowners, local state authorities, or both? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, here in the States, it's the federal government. Okay. okay. Let me check quickly. <laughs> There's another question. Did you have, do you have any experience using satellite data to analyze damage? Are there programs like this? I'm I, can, not aware I, of I can answer that a little bit. The UN actually has a program in place whereby they take pictures, uh, I think at the 50 by 50 meters resolution and they're, they're employing some machine learning uh, techniques to compare different shades of gray and to, 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 to label potential damage. So there, there, there are some programs there. I don't know though how, how and if they're used, but probably they're used now to, to assess damage. You know, uh, let, let, go ahead, Ori. So let me add mine. So here it's something, it's interesting. And you, you often do silly things because that's the way you've always been doing them. But one of the things that we do here is one, first you analyze the damage <clears throat> so you can determine project intent. And I'm talking about housing. Project intent is it means, is it going to be repaired? Is it going to be reconstructed? Or are they going to have to go to a relocation? Uh, and that's one vendor. And after they determine the project intent, the next vendor does another damage assessment to get the scope of work on what they're going to do. To me, it's always been like, why are we doing two of these? And there should be something that we can get from satellite data, at the very least from the topography, to figure out what was the level of uh, flooding, for example. But then again, it only works for flooding and may not work for wind damage. And from there, you can get a decent estimate of the damage and then not have to do that first assessment. But I, I will say that here, it's not been possible to extrapolate data from satellites or, or any other kind of information. There will always have to be foot, uh, feet on the ground trying to figure out uh, the actual damage that occurred. And it's part of compliance. <clears throat> the only thing I'll add is the use of drones um, we, I think that definitely, we, we, in our careers, we've not used that yet, but I envision at some point in the next five to 10 years, that's going to be a vital component of damage assessments. Uh, and I'm sure Jorge or, or myself will, will utilize that technology at some point. So that's something to keep in mind. Perfect. Many thanks. Let me check quickly if we still have questions. No, this... This seems to be it. Uh, we are approaching the five o'clock mark. So David, Jorge, many, many thanks. This was uh, very useful. Um, I, I hope we'll be, be able to come back to you to ask for, for even more details at some point. Uh, the audience was, uh, uh, was very engaged and we received a lot of, uh, a lot of questions. I hope we, we managed to, to, address, uh, to address them. If you have any final comments, uh, Appreciate the opportunity to join everyone today. We are happy to return and discuss on this topic or any or do a deeper dive within disaster management, whether we're talking about procurement or talking about program management. Um, there are many aspects. Um, and at the end of the day, a project is a project. And uh, 
we wish to be able to be as helpful as possible in the rebuilding of Ukraine. Jim, Slava thank Ukraine. You thank you for having us. And if you have any questions, I believe you said that there might be some uh, questions after this. Uh, we'd be happy to answer them by mail. Absolutely. Any Anything and everything I will be receiving, I'll forward it to you. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you all who, who, who came. Have a nice uh, evening. Have a nice day. Bye. Stay in touch. Bye-bye.